Well, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to Mind Books. My name is William. I'm the manager here uh, at Mind Books Edinburgh. Uh, and one of the things that we seek to do as a shop is to make Christ known in Scotland. And the way we seek to do that is to make uh, good, solid, reformed, evangelical Christian literature as freely available as possible to those who need it the most, the population of Scotland. Uh, and we seek to do that by having a presence here in the centre of Edinburgh and Scotland's capital, and also as an online uh, website, Facebook and Instagram page, etc. But with that in mind, I'm very delighted to be joined this morning uh, by Professor Emeritus Donald MacLeod mm -hmm. to discuss his little, latest book, Compel Them to Come In, Calvinism and the Offer, Free Offer of the Gospel. So, Professor, you're very welcome Thank you. to be here. Uh, we'll, just, we'll just start straight in, I think. I would some questions about yourself, your background, perhaps. Yeah. Um, as you're aware, I, I've had the, the immense privilege of being in your lectures myself over the past few years at, when I was at Edinburgh Theological Seminary. But I wonder, just for those who are watching, who are perhaps not as familiar with yourself, uh, could you just provide us a bit of background information about who you are and perhaps why I introduced you as Professor Emeritus, for example? Well, Emeritus because of my great age, of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but... Uh... I was born in Lewis many years ago and brought up uh, in Lewis until I was 17 when I went to Glasgow University. I uh, had a Christian background in my home and community and uh, I look back on those days with nostalgia perhaps but also gratitude because it was a very vibrant, optimistic community post-World War II and one where the Christian faith had a very definite community profile. So I'm very thankful for that. Uh, my student days in Glasgow weren't of any significance. I, I changed my mind halfway through, gave up what I intended to do, and began to pay for the ministry. So, and I, so I was in the college here for, for some three years in the early 60s, and uh, it survived that. And I then went into a pastoral charge in Kilmarney near Fort William, and from there to Glasgow uh, in the district, the, the party district of Glasgow. And I spent 10 very, very happy years in Glasgow for a very mixed congregation. And uh, I came to the college, I guess, sometime around 1978. And I've been here, was here officially until, I guess, 2010. And I then had a staged retirement, so I was told, and I was, I was, and I wasn't retired. So I, I'm still, uh, I do know, and again, going to college as well to give a lecture mm. when invited to do so. So here I am, and uh, I, I, I love theology, and uh, I love preaching, and uh, the two combined uh, very satisfactorily in, in my career. Mm. Very good. Well, thank you very much for that, for filling us in a bit more. And uh, you've, you've written a lot of books over the years. Uh, and I wonder, what is it that particularly enthused you in the first place to get into writing about systematic theology? It's very hard to say. Uh, I probably wrote my first piece for the monthly record of the Free Church of Scotland in 1965, I suppose, a very short piece. Uh, and I then began to get asked to do little pieces you know, for various papers and so on. And I then became uh, the Free Church uh, Records editor from 1977 till about 1990. And in the course of those 13 years, I wrote for the record every month. And uh, uh, I worked on two levels then, apart from colleague, getting other men to write for the record and women as well. Uh, I, I wrote an editorial, which was at one level, one, I too, in fact, one was at a fairly theological level, two and a half thousand words on various Christian topics. The other was uh, a, a political commentary. Uh, so uh, I was both speaking to the church and speaking for the church in my own, from my own point of view. And uh, my early books were, in fact, all byproducts of my record articles. Uh, the first was Spirit of Promise, which mm -hmm. was a series I wrote uh, on uh, general charismatic and Pentecostal issues. And uh, these became a, a small book, which again was uh, published by Christian Focus. Uh, and so that was the first one. And uh, another one, Behold Your God, came from the same source. Uh, and so, uh, really, uh, the, the books were accidental, incidental to my uh, journalistic uh, work. Uh, I, I did eventually uh, 
write some specific uh, uh, stuff for Christian focus on Christian doctrine uh, way, way back uh, last century. I did a series of articles on Christian doctrine in, uh, in uh, church in Glasgow. Mm -hmm. And uh, these became uh, a faith to live by, which is a series of doctrinal studies. Mm -hmm. But they were delivered, in fact, to a, a congregation in Glasgow uh, a way, way back. Uh, I've done two books for IVP, uh, one on the person of Christ and one on the work of Christ, the cross of Christ. Mm -hmm. So th th these were specifically written as monographs for publishing in book form. So in many ways it's been accidental. I, mm. I, I didn't have a still don't have a plan for my life. You know, at my stage I don't need a plan anyway, but uh, I never had objectives. You know, mm. I've been a, in a curious way a drifter and just gone through doors that opened. Okay, very good. But I wonder, is, is there a specific uh, person, a specific theologian who's perhaps inspired your works at all? Have you been like Burkhoff or someone like that, for example? Well, uh, Berkov, I first bought my copy, Berkov, in 1959, and I thought I'd, I looked at the table of contents and I said, if I read this, I'll know everything, because it was so comprehensive, you know. So, yes, I delved into that. Over the years, uh, at, key, at different points, and the younger you are, the more one book influences you. Mm. But as years go by, many influences come together, and uh, no one has the same hold on you. Mm. Uh, I was very much influenced by William Cunningham. Mm -hmm. I got his uh, historical theology in 1961, uh, and I devoured it uh, that summer when I got it. Uh, and people find that very odd because they think Cunningham was so ponderous, but mm -hmm. he was a great uh, identifier of the key issues that were discussed in historical theology. And uh, it was a bit of a master class, I think, in theological method. So uh, that was a profound influence. And even today, I'm supervising some research work uh, on Cunningham, those 70 years or so later, you know, so there we are. But uh, Professor John Murray, and, and uh, he was uh, somebody I knew in his later years, and uh, he was a very august and revered figure. I was I couldn't claim ever to be intimate with him, uh, but again had a huge respect. And some of, of my key ideas that got me into most trouble, uh, I got from him. Uh, his views, for example, on the, the death of the old man. Uh, that's not a process, but an, an, an act mm. in conversion that uh, our old man is crucified. I got that from John Murray, uh, such ideas. But then there have been so many, you know, uh, I was never sure what I was, uh, was I, what was, what matter most was the New Testament studies, which I would have loved to do, but I didn't have enough Greek to do that. So that's why I became more doctrinally oriented. But I do also much to many of the great Anglican commentators, you know, J.B. Lightfoot and others, and then mainly John Stott and John Jim Packer and men of that vintage. Uh, they really had a huge influence on me as well. And uh, they both had the merit, which I don't have, of writing very lucidly and simply, you know, and very accessibly. And that's to be emulated too. Mm. Well, actually, on that last point you, you made there, um, I mean, I've personally read quite a few of your books myself, yes. and I found your language very clear and very simple to understand. Well, I'm glad to know that. And you, you've been you've been come come to known through, be known as throughout Scotland as the people's theologian. Mm. Um, I wonder is the way you write so clearly is that something that comes natural, or is it something that you do have to work on? No, I don't think I work on it specifically, but I do try to eliminate ambiguity. Mm. And when I went through that book this morning, which you have in your hands, yeah. I thought, why did I say it that way? Because uh, I'm never happy with the end product. And every revision, something alters. Uh, today, I found a colon in the wrong place, and it completely destroyed the sense of the sentence. And that annoys me, you know. But bear in mind again that the, these books, most of them began as uh, magazine articles. Mm. They were not aimed at theologians, and I had not written very much for scholars, okay. if at all, yeah. actually. And I, I don't belong to that scholarly community, so I, I do want to address what I would regard as intelligent, literate, reading Christians, you know. And in the Presbyterian Church, there is a large number of such people mm. whose intellectual needs 
It must be made as well as for spiritual needs, the head as well as heart. Very good. Thank you very much. Well, I think if we turn to a bit more detail about the actual book itself now, if that's okay, I'd like to ask um, why why this subject of Calvinism and the free offer of the gospel? Is that because there's no works in that subject already or something else? No, uh, I, I, I was... Uh, Always intrigued as to why, when I was doing my own work, when they were into the record, I was always asked by the media, why are you seeing that now? Mm. And there was a classic answer to that, which I did not invent, but the answer was because the page was empty. <laughs> and that's not quite my, my reason for this one. Uh, the reason was that uh, Mr. McKenzie of Christian Focus asked me to write it. Okay. And you don't disobey Mr. McKenzie. <laughs> so... Uh, I had given a talk on the subject and he sent me a transcript of the talk mm -hmm. which I looked at and didn't like. So I began from scratch and that's why we're here. But I've always had a keen interest in the subject because uh, in my own preaching I've been very uh, bold I think mm -hmm. in the way that I kind of uh, press the gospel home uh, on every hearer and uh, I ask uh, ins for instant compliance. Uh, not go home and think about it, but where you are here and now, and just as you are, you are now confronted by uh, divine invitation, divine command, and you must obey it. And uh, in, in, in my own preaching also, I was still in Glasgow, particularly with people who had a, a long Christian lineage, but uh, did not uh, profess to be Christians by mm. conversion. And I had to fish them out uh, and identify where they were hiding and what they were cover how they were covering themselves up and uh, shielding themselves from the gospel. Mm. And that's part of the chapters in the book, I think. Yeah. That always intrigued me. Why? Mm people run. I mean, I, I knew many instances where I was told that people came to church and said they'd never go back in case they were converted. And yeah. that intrigued me, you know, quite a lot. And also the way we lose so many of our young folk. But basically, it's really about the gospel itself indirectly. What the mm. gospel is, that Christ is the, the only saviour. Uh, he's a complete saviour from both the guilt and power of sin. And he is also the saviour of the whole world. And so uh, you preach the gospel to every people group, but you also preach it to every individual mm. because uh, he is, uh, by becoming incarnate, he identifies with the whole human race and he's the race's saviour. So these are, the, these are the points I'm coming from towards mm. these conclusions. I was also, I, the subtext I guess would have been that there's this constant charge that Calvinists uh, don't uh, preach the gospel freely or universally. And historically that is such a piece of nonsense because mm. some of the most outstanding evangelists have been Calvinists in Scotland and elsewhere. And uh, the revivals which have uh, adorned the church's history have often been uh, through Calvinists who believed in predestination, limited atonement and total depravity and so on. And nevertheless, preach Christ fully, freely, uninhibitedly, and Spurgeon himself, whom I use in the book, it was a prime example of that. Mm. And he was harassed all his ministry by hyper-Calvinists uh, in the surrounding London independent chapels particularly, who maligned him every Monday morning uh, in uh, the magazines for his Arminian-type preaching. So th th that's where, where I'm coming from. In my own young days in the Free Church in Lewis, we heard a gospel which was totally uninhibited. Uh, and uh, the idea that uh, because he was a Calvinist, he wouldn't press Christ home on sinners and do so often with, with tears, that was such a, a travesty of, of my experience. Mm. Mm. Well, you did touch a bit about it there, but... Is there a specific audience that you've aimed the book for? Is it? I know you mentioned earlier on about not normally writing to seminary students. So is it for the general public, people who aren't Christians, or is it for? I would say if it has a narrow or a, it has a general focus, I think because uh, you know it, it is about the gospel itself in mm. some ways. 
But uh, the focus, I guess, is Christian preachers. Mm. And uh, uh, I think that perhaps there are more of them in fetters now than there were in my younger days. And I want to, if I can, in my own little way, to break those fetters. Mm. The, there are there are some who, because they're insecure in their own Calvinism, don't know where the boundaries are. And they stay as far away from the edge as they can, in case they're suspected of being Arminians, or, mm. or being unsound, the general term. And I, I want to deliver them from that bondage and, and feel you know, free to say, God loves you. Mm. And uh, I want to press home the point, if I can, that uh, God's love comes before the faith. Our faith is in God's mm. love. He doesn't love us because we believe, but we believe in Islam. And how can I get that message across? Mm. And I know too many people, you know, have a profound sense of sin and, and they feel so disqualified. So, um, but I guess if the, the specific audience I want to address is the, the preacher, mm. I also wanted to express a uh, lifelong concern about the quality of teaching that we given to our children in the churches because uh, we have made Sunday schools fun. Mm. Now, that in its own way is okay because schools are now fun too and at the moment all the young folk are longing to back to, to school. Mm. Now, in yeah. my young day, Whenever long to get back to school, we had eight weeks summer holidays. We dreaded going back to school. Yeah. These are, that's not the way things are mm. now. But with that fun in the modern school, there are, there are also very uh, well thought out teaching methods, and these are not, not applied in the Sunday schools that mm. I'm familiar with. And I tried sometimes when I had some influence uh, since the mothers or in congregation, try and get the, get to that perspective altered, and give the young folk a grounding. Mm. Uh, to give uh, give one instance in the book, you know, it horrifies me that when you announce uh, a reading from, say, the Book of Exodus, you've got to get the page number. Yeah. Now. By the time we were seven, we knew the, the books of the Bible. Now, that may seem very elementary, you know, but it's a kind of thing. Uh, my, my concern would be then to ask, what should a, a young Christian know by the age of 16, or a young church person, work that out and then deliver it? Mm. And you can't do that in the informal way that's currently the practice in most of our evangelical churches. There, there, is, no, there is no rigor in the teaching process. And I'm saying, well, I, I, I'm not saying rigor in the old sense of, of uh, chalk and blackboard and belt. Uh, I'm talking of the best teaching methods currently available to apply those to the teaching of our young people. Mm. Otherwise, you lose them. Yeah. Because uh, we can only hold our young folk by their consciences. Mm. We have no other pressure to apply to them, nor will we want to. We want their conscientious allegiance, and that must be an informed allegiance uh, to the faith and to the church. Hmm. That's an interesting point. Yeah, no, thank you very much for that. Uh, I've been a Sunday school mis teacher myself in the past, so I completely understand what you're talking about. Yes. Sunday schools more recently are more about morals than about faith in Christ, Yes. things like that. And I think that the lack of learning that even the books of the Bible is something that should be read uh, rectified very quickly yes especially yes, in this generation well there's been a reaction to what is called rote learning mm. and it had its demerits as well you know but it was good to know the lord's prayer and to know the ten commandments and to know the the, the contents and the beatitudes and so on mm. and to all these stored in one's memory and also of course in an order the catechisms that yeah. were a uh, feature of all reformed churches mm. and the children would have known those pretty much verbatim uh, the Heidelberg Catechism and the Shorter Catechism were really such important uh, influences on, on, on my own thinking, for example. And to this day, my poor class had to suffer the Catechism. Uh, even a couple of weeks ago, the, that was my starting point because mm. it gives you such a superb summary uh, of Christian doctrine. Mm. We've lost that catechesis, which was so important in the older days. Mm. That's very true, yeah. So, just coming, coming back to the book, as it were, then. Why, why did you give the book that particular title of Compel Them to Come In? I took it because my... When I read that, there's a sermon and an appendix in that book by C.H. Spurgeon. And uh, I read that sermon many, many years ago. 
and I, at some ways I was amazed just, just to explicitly open and free and full it was. And uh, the actual text of that sermon is uh, compelling to come in. Mm. That's the, from Luke's Gospel. And that's why it's called Compel Him to Come In. And it does uh, you know, make the point that he, be, he begins by saying, I'm in, I'm in a bit hurry, friends, this morning. Mm. So, because I must compel you to come in. So, no introduction. And he also says, uh, I'm not, I don't have a word today for the converted people. Mm. It's for the unconverted folks. So, let's rush on. And he gets on and compels. And he comes at them from every single angle, you know, to shepherd them in. Uh, to to the faith of Christ, so that's why the title is as as, uh, as it is there. It's not compulsion in the sense of coercion, okay. yeah. because we come to Christ freely. Mm. Uh, but it is still a type of preaching that is from the heart, and that conveys to the hearer the impression: a that man believes what he's preaching, mm. which isn't always the case, and b that man really wants us converted. And see, more important still, God wants me to come to him. So it's, it's that kind of compulsion by persuasion mm. that I'm trying to argue for. Uh, Thomas Boston's uh, book I also use, uh, The Art of Man Fishing, mm, yeah. where, he, where the fisherman's a cunning, pretty cunning guy, and uh, so is the preacher in some mm. ways. You know, you've got to, got to know how to catch them. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Uh-huh. Well, in the, uh, in the opening chapter of your book, under the title of Man's Spiritual Bondage, you make a, a great effort to bring forth some of the biblical examples of evangelism, such uh, as uh, John the Baptist and Paul and Jesus Christ himself. Yes. But um, why is it you think that uh, some Reformed Christians, whom we could call hyper-Calvinists, for example, do not appear to follow such a biblically defined example of evangelism? It's quite hard to work it out. I mean, hyper-Calvinism was never a Scottish problem. Mm. It's an English problem, uh, not being racist, I hope, but uh, it did go back to London in the 17th century to the Savoy Conference and so on. And uh, uh, there were many factors that came into play, like antinomianism and so on, that came into that that equation. But uh, I think that insofar as it did play a part in Scottish uh, preaching at some levels, there was a fear uh, of being accused of heresy. Mm. And so you were very, very careful uh, to avoid that particular crit- criticism. That's my impression. One of the best preachers I knew, and a very, very profound pulpit theologian, believed with all his heart in uh, the free offer of the gospel. Mm. But he was the kind of man who had uh, a group of admirers and when he saw them there he was very careful mm. because they were, if not high, but they were very, very ardent Calvinists and they were sermon testers and he would be very careful then just how far he went with them. And I think that that was uh, an important factor in inhibiting men from, from preaching the gospel freely. No, I never saw that in my own native island, and, and uh, it was a bit of a shock to me to find it did prevail some in some places. But uh, I, I think that to an extent, I mean, I had in my own time at college uh, a period when I had students who didn't like the word offer mm. and would not use it. And paradoxically, there were students who were ardent, shorter catechism people. But they were, and the Caribbean says Christ as, as he is freely offered to us in the gospel. Mm. But they still tabooed the word offer. And why that was is the hyper orthodoxy, I don't know. But I think that the virus has been expelled from the church mm. by this point. But it was a dangerous virus. Mm. And we've got to make sure that Christ is preached fully and freely uh, to, to the whole world. And I hope that we don't have a research of hyper-Calvinism in, in Scotland. Mm. Yeah, that's very true. So y- you go on uh, in the book then to discuss the offer, free offer of the gospel in the context of predestination. And within this, you raise a rather interesting argument about 
the fact that if you do not participate in evangelism, you're effect effectively transgressing the command of Jesus in the Great Commandment and yes. the a Great Commission. So would you feel that these hyper-Calvinists we're talking about are transgressing that command? Well, I think that anybody who doesn't obey that command to, and any church that doesn't obey it is guilty of defiance. I mean, my starting point there is the fact that we speak of the sovereignty of God. Mm. And uh, to me, sovereignty means authority. And God's authority is absolute and unconditional. Mm -hmm. And if God says to the church, go and teach, and go to all the Gentiles, and go to every creature, and tell in the language of the man of modern divinity, uh, I have good news for every man, for every person. Mm -hmm. If God says, go and tell everyone, I have good news for you, Christ died for sinners, then you don't have the option of saying, but Lord, what if it's not elected? because my starting point there is that's none of my business. Mm. Uh, I've been told, I've been given a commission, now whether they listen to me or not, I've still got to go and tell them, because that's what I, that's, I'm an ambassador, and I've been told to go and teach, to tell people, to deliver that message to them, and I, if I say, well, God is sovereign, I can't do it, I think that's perverse logic. Mm. God is sovereign, so I must do it, because he is Lord. Mm. And he, the preface to that commission, of course, is, all authority is mine in heaven and mm. earth, go therefore. So the actual preliminary point is, I am the sovereign, and the command follows you, go. Because, and the two are linked inextricably, I think. Mm. And there's a point in Thomas Chalmers' lectures, too, of which I've drawn on quite heavily in my own thinking, that when a person hears the gospel, she is not supposed to ask when she's told to believe in Christ, Abba, am I elect? Mm. That's not the point, is it? The only thing that you know is that at this point you're commanded to believe. Um, but then he says, you can't go forward either and look at, imagine you see the, the day of judgment and you wonder, Abba, am I a sheep or a goat? Mm. All you know is that here and now I'm a person God is calling to faith. That's the whole of what you know. And you must respond to that at that point. Mm. And I have heard sermons which have been compromised by people who had preached marvellous opening sermons into the last few sentences. Uh, and then they spoil the whole thing by saying, of course, there's a doctrine of election. Mm. And then the whole thing unravels psychologically. Uh, that habit is less prevalent, I think, than it was in some circles 50 years ago, mm. but it's still a risk, you know. We, we seem to feel a compulsion to safeguard such a doctrine as, as predestination, as if at all costs don't be suspected of being soft or being wrong on that. Mm. And I, I, I deplore that kind of mentality. Mm. So how, how, how would you go about then bringing a hyper-Calvinist or a strict Calvinist back to the centre ground of preaching, as it were, without them perhaps considering you an Arminian? Well, I've given up on the latter part of that <laughs> question. I think I probably am a, I'm a heretic anyway. <laughs> but my experience of preaching, uh, and I, I did a lot of it many years ago, was that if you preaching arises from the Bible itself, it will convince mm. And uh, I had a congregation at one point, which was very traditional, but were prepared to be, uh, shall I say, all liberated or educated by just showing this what the Bible says. And that's the only hope I would have. If, if these hypercalibrist preachers are genuinely open to biblical teaching, then they will see that the Lord preached to all sorts of people and was often uh, unsuccessful. Mm. And he didn't confine his message at all to the elect, but to all and sundry. And he also, uh, there's also the problem, of course, that people will go off and have, but see uh, how many of those revival people went back and apostatized, you know. And that shows that the message was signed, they weren't properly converted in the first place, the preaching wasn't right in the first place. And you go back to the Lord's own ministry and experience when so many people began and then went back. Mm. And we must not be put off by that experience. In my own experience, I've had many uh, sad encounters with people who were once 
very, very bright believers, but fell away from the faith. Mm. Because very often the, the, the cambio conversion depends on circumstances. If you're in a, in, a, in a vibrant student church and you're caught up in that critical mass of enthusiasm, mm. then it's all very easy. But when you go to an area where there is no church at all virtually and no support, it's a hard struggle then. Mm. And uh, that's why we need to have people grounded firmly in biblical teaching. Mm. Right, well, thank you very much. Uh, so, going on then, just perhaps briefly to discover, to discuss the subject of divine sincerity uh, and its relation to the free offer of the gospel. Mm. Would you con would you consider that preaching about the wrath of God that is to come to the unrepentant as being of equal value as preaching the free offer of the gospel in the first place? I'm not sure it would be of equal value because, for one thing, uh, our own conscience has registered God's wrath. Mm. You know, from Romans 1, we know that God is a just God mm. and will hold us all to account. So that wrath is, in fact, it is a, a something we know by nature mm. from general revelation. Whereas the message of God's love is a complete bombshell mm. to the conscience. Uh, and that's why it is actually very hard to believe in it, in God's love. Mm. We may imagine that today we all believe in the love, but nobody believes in the wrath. That is completely wrong. Mm. There are very few folk who believe that God loves them. But there are many consciences that tell them that God is angry with sin, and that one day they'll be held to account for their sin. So, but I, I do make the point that only those who are in fact aware of God's holiness and of their unfitness to meet him on the last day, on the day of judgment, only they will come to Christ because mm. there has to be a sense of need. Mm. And if people say to me, well, you can, unless they have a sense of need, they won't come. And they conclude, therefore I won't preach them till they have a sense of need. But I go back to the Senator Dort on that, which insisted that you create that sense of need. In other words, you convince them of accountability, uh, of God's righteous judgment and of God's anger against sin. So we preach both the free offer and we preach uh, repentance, faith and repentance. The hyper-Calvinist logically will not endeavour to convict men of sin mm. because only God, he would say, can do that. For us, the Calvinist will preach both the free offer and the elements that persuade to repentance because the Lord preached both repentance and faith. The, the summons was twofold and so must ours be, you know. And in some ways, there is an urgent need today to create that, uh, that point of contact where people do have a sense of spiritual need uh, and uh, uh, spiritual hunger and uh, will therefore listen to the gospel, shall I say, with, with interest anyway, mm. because you know, they, they know there's something wrong. There's a danger there too that we come to Christ to meet, to satisfy your own needs. Mm. For us at one level, the fact that he is Lord means every knee bow. It's not just about meeting your needs. But uh, the, without that sense of need, we won't come because the whole, those who are well, don't need a doctor, the Lord himself says to us. So how, does a, how can a preacher make them feel unwell? Mm. Oh, yeah. To seek a physician. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Well, perhaps uh, turning into a more practical point, some more concluding questions here. In the, the, the last few chapters of your book, you discuss the, the delivery of the free offer of the gospel and also, as you've already mentioned, about how to flush out sinners, as it were, from their place of false security. Yeah. And you also refer in those chapters to the necessity to convey to the unbeliever that they are not putting their faith in faith itself, but in yeah. the love of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Um, and you also make mention that it should conversion should not be based on what you give up, but rather upon what you take on. Why is it, do you think, that mainstream churches have perhaps neglected those points? 
It's sort of a blanket answer. I think mm. there's a degree of legalism yeah. uh, in every human being, and uh, we all want to be saved in ways that to credit to ourselves, mm. which is salvation by works. Uh, and uh, one symptom of that is that even those who say, well, uh, I can't keep the Ten Commandments, but I'm a believer, and you put your faith in faith itself, which mm. was a, an early uh, 17th century view, a form of legalism, where the faith itself becomes meritorious. And uh, paradoxically then people say, but my faith's not good enough, and they doubt their own faith. And so they're back again in that legalistic vortex, mm. where the work of faith has all its own deficiencies, and the result again is loss of assurance, which is a very important part of, of Reformed spirituality, that we should know we are saved. But uh, you know that uh, if, if faith is the rock you're standing on, it's a very insecure rock. Mm. And I have mentioned before a story I heard there is a kind of reference to your own uh, native country, I think, uh, where there, there was a student of my generation preaching on the mound in the open air, and uh, there was a drunken gentleman who kept interrupting him every few minutes by saying, Shamrock, <laughs> Shamrock. And, and the preacher had an inspired moment, and he quoted to him, you know, uh, uh, all of the ground is shamrock mm. and faith is shamrock it will not take the strain uh, only Christ will do so and you have to put your faith in him mm. the other form of this is you know that it's a conversion the quality of our conversion that matters am I truly born again mm. Did my experience follow the right sequence of despair followed by relief? Is my conversion different from other people's? Uh, and then you conclude, well, yes, I am born again. But you can't put your faith in your new birth. Mm. But being born again, you put your faith in Christ. Mm. I, I, I have one great uh, antipathy, and that is to be asked to give my testimony. Because my testimony is not worth telling. And it's not what matters. Mm. The, you know, how I was converted is, is a, a total red herring. What really matters is wherever I began and by whatever steps I moved forward, did I come to Christ? That's mm. all that matters. And my, yes, I have a testimony, but my testimony is we have a great high priest, Hebrews chapter 4. That's, that's my, his greatness is a testimony not my conversion, my story. Now I know that today it's a very common way of evangelizing and mm -hmm. I've heard countless testimonies, but uh, I don't have a story to tell. I didn't have a dramatic, dramatic conversion mm -hmm. and I, I, I don't think that whether I'm born again is a question. Mm -hmm. Whether I am or not born again, the moment I hear that gospel, I must now come to Christ. And if I think I'm not born again, then the answer is, well, go to Christ immediately. Mm. That's the answer to that. Mm. I'm rambling on, but the way these are the things that were, you're inviting me to cover. Uh, well, it was actually, a, and the next question is actually a similar point. Is it, what, what would you say then to someone who is, who claims to have faith, but yet remains unrepentant? Well, that's a contradiction, you know. Mm. Uh, there is a, a turning from idols as well as a turning to God. Mm. And uh, repentance means re renunci self-renunciation, you know, that uh, you, you are simply a sinner, and that's your identity. Uh, you, even as when you come to Christ, you are, st you are still a sinner, mm -hmm. but you are not only a sinner, but you, you are still a sinner. So a sinner, a repentant sinner, is somebody who has faced the truth about himself or herself, mm -hmm. because uh, repentance is honesty. Mm. What the kind of person that I am, and uh, the two things go together. You you turn you in uh, you turn from sin. You turn to God. But we never completely overcome sin. It's a lifelong battle mm. to conform our lives to God's own pattern. But also, there'll be no repentance unless there is faith. Mm. And I do labour that point in the book. Mm going back to Calvin and the matter of modern divinity, that uh, faith always comes before repentance. Mm. 
the hybrid Calvinist was inclined to say that only penitents can come to Christ, repentance before faith. Mm. But the true gospel position, in my view, is that you must have a grasp of God's mercy before you turn to him mm. and turn from the idols or from self. You, you're the main idol is oneself. We all worship ourselves mm. and we want to uh, go to heaven with our he heads held high as a self-made, redeemed people, self self-saved. We can't do that. Mm. So all our hope lies in God's in God's mercy. So just as a final question, I mean, we've looked a bit more practically perhaps than theoretically at your book, but as a, as a final question, is there, is there one thing that you would wish for people to take away from your book? And if so, what would that be and why? It's quite hard to reduce the gospel to, yeah. to one thing, but uh, I think I began by making the point that uh, the fundamental thing is that Christ is the Saviour, a complete, total save from mm. sin. But I, I suppose that people, readers will know that before they start. Mm. So I'm really trying to say to preachers from a Calvinist background, yes, you hold firmly to God's sovereignty, the sovereignty of grace in all its forms. And if you care to, all five points of the tulip, if that's the way you, your mind happens to work. But you must preach the whole gospel, including, including for example, Christian liberty, a neglected element of Christian in, in reform uh, preaching, in, in my younger days certainly. But preach him uninhibitedly, not worrying what the sermon tester is thinking, but what the sinner in front of you is thinking, mm. or the believer in front of you, or above all, with the Christ at your elbow is thinking of it. And don't worry about the sermon testers, mm. but just preach the, the gospel you know to be biblical and to be the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. Well, thank you very much, Professor, for coming and joining us today. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much for joining us uh, today, everyone who's been watching this on our YouTube page or Facebook, and also those who are joining us from the Evangelical Bookshop in Belfast. Uh, just to remind you that uh, we are online, we are open for orders online, uh, and Donald McLeod's new book, Compel Them to Come In, is on our website for eight ninety nine, uh, and we do offer free delivery as well, free postage and packaging. So please do follow us on our Instagram and Facebook accounts, and uh, keep safe, and we'll let you know whenever we're available to open the shop. Thank you.